So I, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sarah Wilson. I'm the executive director of the St. Joseph Museums. I'm the current president of the Missouri Association of Museums and Archives. And we've been putting on um, these weekly programs to help us all learn while we're going through uh, the pandemic. And a couple of weeks ago on one of our Friday conversations, it came up the topic, um, Missouri agriculture and what we were kind of doing to survive the, the pandemic and thinking about food. And so we wanted to bring a program for our museums that would kind of touch on this topic and idea. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, something I wanted to share is uh, something I actually just came across today. Um, and it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and Walter Cronkite who was Missouri's or the most trusted man in America um, actually was a native of St. Joseph. And so this is his conclusion of the very first Earth Day 50 years ago. And I saw it and I thought it was something um, that was really timely and relevant and, and might shape the conversation today. So it's just a couple minutes. I'm going to play it for you guys. So I thought that was a pretty interesting message um, in the context of 50 years, the anniversary of Earth Day and thinking about the pandemic and um, gosh, oil prices down very low and um, we're getting some music. Somebody's giving me some background music. That's fantastic. Hold on one second. That's, that's me giving myself background music. So, um, <laughs> woo, shocking. So, um, when we were having our conversation a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that I shared was um, I love living in Missouri because it's so abundant that we have so many natural resources here. Um, today, the Missouri Humanities Council is doing the virtual water symposium, and that's been really um, amazing to see as well. And, and they're helping us sponsor these talks. And 
So, you know, I moved back to Missouri um, and started really paying attention. I grew up here to things that were around me that I could like just wildly harvest. Um, and so probably most of you guys know about morel mushrooms. That's a big deal right now. And hopefully a lot of you are out um, harvesting those. But, you know, we have so many black walnuts in Missouri. We have pawpaws, which if you don't know what those are, are like custardy bananas that grow wild here um, that are delicious. And, I, you know, I think about, and Candy can probably add to the conversation, maybe we'll have her on the program sometime, you know, the Native peoples were living here, you know, well before all of the modern conveniences that we see. They didn't have to go to the grocery store to get food. I mean, everything was here. It was all around them. And today, we still have a lot of that, um, that great abundant, abundance. Um, and so the Missouri State Museum is putting on uh, an exhibit, a traveling exhibit about uh, agriculture in Missouri. And we, pr we produce a lot of food for the whole world. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure that their questions are coming um, from this sort of perspective of um, how is agriculture important? What is the history of agriculture in Missouri? What is the future um, for our planet of agriculture in Missouri? Um, so we wanted to have them come and, and speak with us about their process. So we have Tiffany Patterson um, and Jamie Henry here today, and I'm going to turn the program over to them and uh, let them go into their process. So go ahead, guys, take it away. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, so I, I am Jamie Henry. I'm the assistant director for the Missouri State Museum, and I'll let Tiffany introduce herself. I'm Tiffany Patterson. I am the director of the State Museum at Jefferson Landing State Historic Site. So for this presentation, we kind of split it into two parts. Uh, this is very much a curated exhibit by Tiffany. Um, my favorite story about the entire exhibit is how she decided to curate it was on, I think, a Tuesday, she told me that she wanted to get out of the whole doing exhibits game and leave it to me and our curator of exhibits. And then the next day, she came in and pitched doing an exhibit on Missouri agriculture. Um, and so that's what kind of, yeah, that's what kind of kicked it off about two years ago. Uh, and at the Missouri State Museum, we have a history of traveling exhibits. So uh, mostly before our time there, a lot of the older exhibits include African American history, specific exhibits from like the early 2000s. Uh, there were some earlier examples of, uh, for the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial, um, things like that. We currently have two exhibits that we've developed in the last three years, and I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, if I can remember where to find it. There we go. Um, so uh, the first one is Boom, the Rise and Fall of Missouri's Black Business Districts, and uh, Sarah actually is hosting it up at St. Joe right now, I think, right? Yeah, yep. yeah, so we still have there. Um, and I chose this photo. Uh, if you can see in the back, there's like a six foot tall banner. Um, I didn't really get a good picture of it. I'm not in the office, so I had to use what I had. But this is actually a Jim's journey, and I'm going to kind of talk about this. But uh, one of the things about traveling exhibits that we've had to think through, and especially with, with Deeply Rooted, is um, you know what kind of venues are we looking for and who can host it? Uh, if you've been to Jim's journey in Hannibal, it's a very tiny museum and they wanted to host it because we highlight Hannibal in the exhibit. And so this is one of the ways that we did it where we actually built these little stands um, with kind of smaller uh, versions of the pop-up banners so that more we could fit more in the small space. Um, so we have that exhibit. And then we also have uh, the Benton pop-up. So in the Missouri State Capitol where the museum is, we have the Thomas Hart Benton uh, Social History of Missouri mural that's in the uh, house lounge um, and we actually recreated that as a pop-up traveling exhibit and so those two projects kind of informed our process on deeply rooted and um, I will stop sharing my screen there we go and I wanted to just kind of show those and I'm happy to send pictures and things like that but deeply rooted is kind of the third uh, installment of our revamp of the traveling exhibits so each one of the new exhibits um, we completed in the past three years uh, to expand. And then also each one has its own kind of unique um, process for how we developed it. So 
boom was pop-up banners, as you saw. Uh, Benton is more of a stretched fabric kind of uh, metal frame exhibit, uh, which is it's, it's just an interesting thing. And then Deeply Rooted will be kind of um, a little bit different from that. They're hop-ups, so they're kind of these expanding structures in the center. Uh, and then it's still uh, printed on fabric and kind of pulled over like a pillowcase. Um, and so with all that, I'm going to just kind of zip through some of the logistics uh, that we go through during our process. So the first question we had was, what was the big idea? And for Tiffany, um, she'll kind of go into that a little bit more. But we also needed to figure out the scope. And I think that was the one thing that as a team, we kind of sat down and Tiffany laid out all the different things that she was talking about. Um, had kind of come across during her research. Uh, and then we had to help narrow that down a little bit, but also we wanted it to be broad enough so that different institutions would be able to adapt it to their own needs. A great example of that is what Sarah and the St. Joe Museums did with Boom. They actually added their own story to Boom um, with the Black Business District that was in the St. Joseph area that was not covered in the exhibit. Um, the next step, and this one was kind of decided from the beginning, but is who is going to write the content and who's going to research it. Uh, this is definitely a labor of love for Tiffany. Um, and on some days I think it's a labor of uh, annoyance because- It's just she labor. Had to, yeah, like, it's just labor. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that one was pretty easy, but we did have some help along the way. And then also we have kind of a review process that goes through the exhibit staff and our interpretation staff. Um, the next question that we kind of tackled was what do we want it to look like? Uh, I think before we even got started, we had some ideas, but after we produced the Benton exhibit and we saw how good it looked printed on fabric, we really kind of gravitated to that. And, and so for that, we were wondering, do we want it to be like a poster exhibit? Is it going to be something we have to fabricate? Um, and then, uh, how do we like do that? How do we go through a, a print shop and all that kind of stuff? Uh, and then the third option, which some places go through is, is it an actual installation? So are you producing something that is going to go um, and be installed in their space where you develop uh, specific cases and you have different types of panels and then it has to fit into a very specific kind of footprint. So a lot of larger museums will have that. We wanted something because we try and keep all of our exhibits free. Uh, we wanted something that would be easy to put up um, with, you know, instructions. So in case we can't travel to help set it up, we also wanted something that was all self-contained. So you didn't have to worry about the layout outside of just kind of getting them all up in, in a room. Um, we kind of set a timeline and I think, uh, Tiffany, correct me if I'm wrong, it's probably been about 14 months since you started, isn't it? 14 probably. to 16 months, yeah. Yes, the hardcore stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so probably uh, our timelines usually range between 12 months and 18 months. Um, and that's just, you know, something you always want to consider with any project. Like, what is your timeline? Uh, where, you know, most of us are fortunate that we can kind of set that our, on our own. But uh, with budgets, uh, our budget year is uh, something that we have to plan around. So, that, so that's something that we have to think about. We don't charge for exhibits, but that's something that you could ask, like, are you going to charge? Are you going to take a deposit? Um, and how will you collect that? Uh, a lot of places don't have a, a way to collect that. Um, the other major one that we're kind of going through right now is who's going to manage the exhibit as far as who's going to schedule the um, reservations, who's going to travel it, are you going to have somebody kind of do the upkeep on it or update it? Um, who's going to be doing different odds and ends with it as far as social media or kind of doing advertisements or reaching out to institutions to host it. Um, and then going along with that, what kind of materials do you need to supply host sites with? So are you going to have brochures or programs or sample documents? Uh, will you have condition report forms if, if it's something that you're putting out there? Um, and then there's probably a bunch of other things that if I had more time, uh, I probably but we would probably get into them specifically. But, but that's kind of how we went through the entire process. And um, I don't have children, but like uh, most of my analogies, they have to do with having children. So it's kind of like you with the exhibit, the exhibit is your kid and the person that 
is hosting the exhibit is babysitting for you and you come up with this ex over exhaustive list for them to follow but they don't really have to do all that um so with that said we utilized a basic management project management structure um and like i said this was very much a passion project for tiffany so i'm going to turn it over to her to kind of go through how the content kind of led her through the creative process um that was then you know a part of all the logistical discussions that we had all right thanks for that lead in jamie and i have to give a shout out to john peterson who's on this conference um meeting too because he helped with uh he helped with some of the writing and he also edited everything. So thank you, John. Um, last week when you guys had the host of the meeting on relevance, it really struck me what an amazingly relevant topic agriculture is. And Sarah kind of um, hinted at this in her introduction. Um, agriculture is a very human story. Um, we all need to eat or we all like to eat anyway. Um, and we also have farmers in the United States and elsewhere willing to take on the risks of the unknown. Um, farmers today uh, face many of the same risks that farmers 3000 years ago were facing in Missouri. Um, uncontrollable weather, pests, problems with storage, all kinds of things. And as Sarah said, this particular kind of presentation came around because uh, Jamie kind of overheard Candy and others talking about their interest in prehistoric agriculture and how museums were using gardens and other things to kind of tell the, a larger story of um, the use of like medicinal plants and food native plants and those kind of things. And, um, and to me, it even has a larger implication because archaeologists and paleobotanists and others are looking at prehistoric agriculture as a means of informing agriculture today. You know, maybe some of these native plants um, like lamb's quarter, or goose foot, or um, what's the Latin chinopodium album uh, could be cultivated in the Midwest today and help us through climate change in the future because they are more suited to our climate than than uh, you know, imported um, agricultural products. So I think it just has this kind of rippling effect um, as far as um, how we look at agriculture past and present. Um, and even like techniques of prehistoric farming, one of the things that, and I guess I, I can share my, see if I can share my screen with you uh, here with the correct, Oops, I am a technophobe here. So this is just kind of the opening, the opening uh, title panel. But um, so on our prehistoric agricultural panel, all of our panels in the exhibit try to tie past and present. So we talk about um, like Cahokia and the foods that were so supporting Cahokia and um, communities like you see here, Tawasagi, which was uh, kind of a miniature version of Cahokia um, in that there was a ceremonial side in agricultural fields and other things. But even techniques that Native Americans used, one of the you know, native plants that informed a lot of the diet were nut trees. And Missouri has a lot of native nut trees. And one of the things that archaeologists and botanists believed happened is that Native Americans would or Native peoples would set fire around um, Native nut groves and um, that would not only make it easiest, easier to harvest the nuts, it would make it easier to hunt because um, turkey and deer would have less habitat to hide behind. And also we're discovering today that that biochar, the char that um, was left by um, the burning of plants is a soil amendment. And nut growers today are using that, uh, using biochar and charcoal to amend the soil to improve, to improve growth and to um, reduce the need for irrigation. So, um, you know, practices of a thousand years ago are informing uh, modern practices here in Missouri today. So um, it's kind of an interesting kind of twist on um, 
you know, our study of, of prehistoric agriculture. I lost my notes here. Um, um, and a more kind of an immediate relevance for looking at, you know, the reason that mom is hosting these conferences is to kind of educate us or talk about our institutions in a post COVID um, pa pandemic world. And if you're watching the news, you see that our farmers are dealing with some of the, you know, some of this, it's like all about supply chain. I mean, are we, we're, we're worried about the health of our farmers. We're worried about getting farm workers um, to the places where food is harvested. Um, and we're worried about how to get um, food from the fields to processing to our grocery stores and to our homes. And, and I'm hoping that some of the conversations that come out of the places that are hosting, that will host this exhibit is this kind of look at maybe we need to do a better job at regionalizing our food systems. Like how do we, how do we invest in local foods? How do we increase the diversity of our local uh, food sources. Um, so that's kind of one of the conversations that I hope we, we kind of spawn out of this larger exhibit. Um, and, and Jamie said this was a passion for me, and it really is in that um, it kind of grew out of my own experience. I grew up in rural Missouri. Um, I was a town kid, but um, the town that I grew up in in southeast Missouri, it pulsed with agriculture. So everybody knew when things were going to be harvested. Everybody knew when calving was taking place. Everybody knew um, when things were happening. And living in Jefferson City for the last 20 odd years, um, Jefferson City is not a huge city by any stretch of the imagination, but it really is a city that pulses with government and not agriculture. So, you know, personally, I felt that this kind of growing separation between me as a consumer and my roots as like, a, you know, growing up having a garden and going to my grandparents' farm and, and those kind of things. So um, it's been kind of a an interest to me, like how do we as a people reconnect with um, where our food comes from. And, and again, this has relevance, not just personally, but since everybody eats, um, and, you know, it's relevant to even people in major metropolitan areas because a lot of people in metro areas live in food deserts. I mean, we're a land of plenty, but you can't even get to a market to get food. So um, that's a, another conversation that I hope um, is kind of spawned out of this. And we do even have a panel on urban urban agriculture. Um, and uh, seriously or um, jokingly, we are doing a series of um, social media posts leading up to the launch of, of Deeply Rooted. And in one of my posts, I jokingly said that this whole exhibit came out of a ham sandwich that I was like looking at my plate one day and thinking, well, Missouri has a lot of hogs. Uh, why are, you know, is this ham from Missouri and we grow a lot of weed is this bread from Missouri and um, that experience kind of caused me to look around and start talking to people. Um, I started talking to people with backgrounds like me who were living in the city but grew up in rural areas, people who were involved in farming now but grew up in urban areas, uh, people at farmers markets. I just started talking and listening to people and um, I'm sure many of you have, who have developed exhibits in the past, um, when you start thinking about a subject, it comes up everywhere. And I don't know if I was bringing up the subject or if other people were um, just happened to be discussing it, but even in discussions about Missouri Bicentennial or other or Trailblazers exhibit that Jamie and others are working on, um, <clears throat> this, this topic of agriculture kept coming up. And it's also a story for us at the State Museum that um, I think is uniquely ours to tell in a way because um, we're in the Capitol. Um, who's on top of the Capitol? You know, Ceres, the goddess of agriculture, tops our building. So, um, you know, we're uniquely connected to the larger story of agriculture in Missouri. And also, um, when we, uh, we, when the Missouri State Museum was started in the Capitol in 1919 and the Resources Hall was established in 1921, one of the things that the museum was charged to do was kind of highlight the story of the 
products of our fields and um, forests. So um, it's kind of a, a good story and meets our larger mission um, within the capital and, and within Missouri. Uh, so um, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but uh, just a few more, a couple more minutes. And uh, Jamie said that, you know, we met and we kind of it narrowed the topics, but I will tell you that this is an exhibit that got out of hand. It just like, I thought initially it would be really about local foods and how do we make that connection with people and the consumer using Missouri history. And it just, it just grew, it just exploded and became probably one of our larger traveling exhibits that we will do at least in the near future. And part of that was I kept asking people questions. You know, I'd go and interview people with this kind of narrow topic in mind. And I would say at the end of every interview, I would say, so if you were going to do an exhibit on Missouri agriculture, what would you, the expert, talk about? And of course they were happy to answer. So I heard like prehistoric agriculture and women in agriculture. And well, we, we just, we were in the midst of a huge flood when I was starting the design of this. So they were like, well, you have to talk about the hazards of farming and all that, that. And then I was getting really close to the end. And um, I blame the interpretive staff because I was sent it out for a review and they were like, you're not talking about livestock. We could do some great, we could do some great programming about farm animals. So that had to be that we kind of scooped that in kind of toward the end of the um, exhibit planning process. So it just, it just grew and grew and grew. And, you know, we were also informed by kind of larger issues in the museum world and within state parks, because, you know, the Missouri State Museum is part of the state parks um, system. And one of the conversations that we should have been probably having for the last 50 years, but we're just now having now is like, we tell a lot of white guy stories. Um, most of our stories, if you go to an historic site, are about white guys. Um, and so we couldn't, I couldn't in good conscience tell the story about Missouri agriculture and let people think that it was a bunch of white guys who came and started farming because that's not the case. Because we've always had, you know, Native Americans have been cultivating and harvesting native plants in Missouri for around 3,000 years. So we really needed to kind of tell that story. And also the, 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 um, uh, this idea that, well, Native Americans, women were the farmers and, and women have always had a major role in agriculture in Missouri, whether that, that's been a primary role or a kind of a behind the scenes role in agriculture. So um, we wanted to be able to tell kind of that those stories too. So the traveling exhibit covers prehistoric agriculture um, to the present. And in every panel, I kind of showed you the, the prehistoric panel, just gave you a glimpse of it. It has, um, we talk about prehistoric architecture, architecture, sorry, it was an architectural story in, in a previous life, um, that ag prehistoric agriculture, we tie it to mo something modern. And every every panel we try to do that. We talk about a piece of Missouri history and then we correlate it to something that's going on now. So we talk about prehistoric agriculture, women in agriculture, or, uh, market gardening, market gardening and urban agriculture, kind of the farm to market from kind of one of our earliest international project products of hemp to to like now we're really looking at kind of international marketing of our, our national marketing of organic grains. Um, agricultural education is a very important part of Missouri's heritage. So we have a panel on building better farms and building better farmers. Um, livestock, thanks InterpSAP, and um, hazards of farming. And then going back to kind of this original um, intent, we also have a, the last panel is kind of a series of actions that we can take as consumers to better connect ourselves with agriculture. So that's kind of the big picture. We're working on a lot of other stuff in conjunction um, with the static exhibit. Um, our interp staff is working on a traveling trunk and um, curricula that will go with the, can go out with the um, trunk. 
Um, we're doing a social media campaign. Um, for those of you familiar with the Missouri State Museum, we have a monthly kind of guest lecture and two of our programs um, are specifically associated with a uh, deeply rooted one will be a wine tasting woo woo, all about Missouri wine and um, then uh, Gail. Uh, oh my gosh, not Gail Fritz. Um, John, help me. Uh, type in who's coming in September. Uh, Gina Powell. Gina Powell is coming in September to talk about prehistoric agriculture in Missouri. So as kind of a deeply rooted slash um, archaeology month uh, presentation. So um, that's kind of the big picture. I'm going to turn it over to Jamie because um, with COVID and other things and kind of a larger discussions within the museum about um, extending um, the life of our work and our programs. Um, we're also looking at kind of a digital component to this and but Jamie's our techie. So um, I'll turn it over to him. Uh, before I kind of talk about that. Does anybody have any questions for Tiffany. I don't want to, I don't want it to get too far. Sorry, I just like to on. No, that's fine. Oh, and John said our Tuesday series this summer will be agriculture based. Yes, thank you, John. Um, okay, if, if nobody has any questions, the the uh, uh, other elephant in the room with this exhibit, uh, we were planning to launch it in June. Um, obviously, that has been pushed back a bit. And what, for whatever reason, um, if you go to our website, uh, the Missouri State Museum, it, it's like kind of like time traveling almost like going to one of our spaces. It's like going back into the 90s. Um, just because the, the websites have to be similar so that if you navigate to one State Parks website, it's the exact same as the other one. And one of the things that we're kind of exploring right now is how to make things like this digital. So especially with a traveling exhibit, we've been pretty much primarily working on panel exhibits. So Boom is you know a rectangular panel and deeply rooted is a square rectangular panel, depending on which one you're looking at. And so uh, I had been wondering how we could make this a meaningful digital experience. And whether that be, we just make a page on the website where we take all the information and then we try and format it to look similar. Is there a way that we you know, put the PDFs themselves up on the website? And what we're looking into right now and still kind of navigating through is making interactive PDFs similar to online magazines. So a lot of online magazines and things like that have these um, interactive, uh, basically embedded documents in your page uh, that is then you're able to manipulate and kind of zoom through it. And so the idea is that we would have an embedded version of the panel that makes up the exhibit uh, and then the visitor or whoever is viewing it um, can still get to the content or can revisit the content after they've seen the exhibit in person if they had questions. Um, we're also looking at adding audio components to it, something that is very difficult to travel um, if you don't have you know, dedicated uh, resources for it. And with an exhibit like this, building an audio cabinet to travel means that limits the places that it could go to because you have to have somebody that could go and set it up or troubleshoot it. Um, and so that's kind of where we're at. And actually, uh, let me pull up a, what kind of gave me the idea for it. And I've seen a lot of online um, magazines and things like that before. Uh, but what I'm doing, what I actually got the idea from was a comic book website where you can read comic books online. And so uh, basically, uh, there's this website called Comixology, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, that kind of gave me the idea and we're exploring it with some other people. So they have this thing called Guided View. And so it's um, basically you get a comic like this and you can kind of navigate through it with the different panels similar to how ours is set up and then when you go down you can zoom in and then navigate with your mouse or they have this function called guided view which i haven't figured out how to do yet but yeah so 
it's kind of neat. So that's kind of what gave me the idea for an interactive embedded PDF in it. And there's a lot of websites uh, that have that option for their magazines. Um, and so that's kind of what we're thinking of doing. Um, but yeah, it, it's an interesting time because um, not only are we worried about opening the exhibit and what kind of visitor ship will we have, but also when we travel the exhibit, um, is there going to be a lull in people requesting um, the exhibit? And then also as a, as a museum that's the state museum, how do we reach communities that may not be able to get the exhibit, but they can still reach that content? And so those were kind of the, the factors that contributed to us kind of looking into that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I will. We're still working through it. And most of it is going to be um, on the IT side. If we find a solution, will our website be able to support it? And I am the techie, but I'm more mystified by technology, not necessarily good at it. Um, and so that's a question for somebody that is much more knowledgeable than me. Um, and with all that, we are taking bookings for the exhibit. We're not sure exactly when, but if you are interested in hosting it, um, let us know. But if anybody has any questions, Tiffany and I are happy to answer them. I will say that your um, advertisement of today's presentation actually got us our first booking. So um, we had a uh, someone out of uh, St. Louis County contact us and Sophie, who I think is on the on the line, she she and I were like, wow, we haven't even la launched it uh, at our own museum yet. But uh, but they may be interested because of this in one of our other traveling exhibits. So that's been kind of fun. Jamie, we did such a great job. No, nobody has questions. Uh, Sarah, you have our email, so you can just email us for request bookings. <laughs> yeah, you know we'll take we'll take it in St. Joe. Uh, it's, it's an important topic, and we're excited to share it. So, um, do, do people have questions for Jamie or Tiffany? I'll I'll start with a question. Um, and, and it's for either of you guys. Um, so do you feel like as you've been developing the topic, you're trying to um, navigate a little bit of controversy in terms of like planet and climate change and large scale agricultural practices? And is, I mean, sometimes that's a divide, sometimes it's not. How are you, how are you walking that line? Well, I was I felt kind of sneaky in that since um, I was curating it, I, I didn't really get into big agriculture because, you know, you start looking at Monsanto and all these other things that have a long Missouri roots. I mean, uh, it, it can get sticky. And my intent was really to connect people with their local agriculture. So um, with with very few exceptions, most of the people I talk to, you know, I talk to the people at the Ag Park, uh, the, oh, the Center for Urban Agriculture in Columbia. I talk to an uh, elderberry grower. Um, I talk to um, organic farmers, uh, those kind of things. So I probably skewed the um, exhibit somewhat because I wanted people to really focus on, um, let's talk about the, the food around us uh, to the to the extent possible and i um, kind of start stayed away from because that's a rabbit hole you know any one of these topics um, that we hit on women and prehistoric and and candy I want you to do a prehistoric agriculture exhibit um, I'm I'll I'll be there with bells on because there's so much there but um, each of these topics could spawn something larger and corporate agriculture is just I mean, that's like 80, 80 exhibits. So, um, so we, you know, try to keep it small and approachable. Like what, you know, you're not going to run up to Monsanto and start a conversation, but you're, you might um, run up to your local um, organic popcorn grower and start a conversation. And that's, that's the kind of the intent of the exhibit is like, how can the average Joe who doesn't know much about that agriculture kind of approach um, agriculture in Missouri and, and farmers in Missouri. So, so kind of sneaky. 
to to avoid conflict as much as we can. Well, and I and I think that's in line with sort of um, making it relevant to people, making it accessible, and you know allowing them to just really get into their food and have that relationship with their food. Uh, Sarah Buchanan says, um, "How did you select artifacts or museum items to showcase?" Oh, uh, well, we're working on that. So we won't travel any um, artifacts. We're hoping that the venues that um, that host it will kind of dig out of their own collections of things that represent their area. Um, Kate Owens, who I don't think is on this, Kate gets a demerit for not showing up, but no. <laughs> uh, uh, she she kind of pulled a list of things based on some of the topics we talked about. And then Jay, Kate, Jamie, and I kind of went through the list of all of our agriculture stuff and, and kind of pulled out some items that, um, will, uh, that we'll showcase when it's at the museum. So I can't remember all of them, but they're like state fair ribbons. There's um, some prehistoric agricultural tools. There's some modern uh, or modern in a relative sense, uh, late 19th, early 20th century American tools. Um, I think we pulled out some farm toys because everybody loves farm toys. Um, what else, Jamie? Can you remember what's on the list? I, th I, think, uh, I think that was pretty much it. One other consideration for that was the space where we were going to have the exhibit. So we were going to have it in the center hall of the museum of the history hall. And so we didn't want to have any large oversized pieces either, because I think we could have had like some large plows and, and things like that, but we didn't really have a, a way to protect them. So, so that was another uh, consideration for it. I do want to say that there was like one or two, um, maybe like, like books or something like that, or maybe like uh, catalogs, maybe? I thought too that we were going to replace the mineral warfare that's in our World War I exhibit and put a plow on that platform because it looks yeah. like a, 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 good plow a field platform, that needs yeah. to be, because uh, we recycle everything in the museum. It's Earth Day, we, everything gets like eight uses. Yeah. Um, so. I have a question. How do you guys deal with Food, like I like to show what black walnuts look like, but having food in exhibits, of course, causes pests. So are you guys even doing photos or replicas or how do you deal with that kind of thing? Well, the, the exhibit's really photo laden. So we have um, examples like on the prehistoric panel of, uh, we compare a uh, lamb's quarter or Chenopodium album with um, quinoa, which is a close cousin. Um, there's walnuts, there's nut trees, there's other things um, in there. Um, I'm hoping our traveling trunk that will go out will have some um, agricultural products that are encapsulated um, so they won't draw pest. Um, so, and we're, we're hoping to showcase food a little bit in our actual opening if we get to have an opening. So we'll have all Missouri foods and drinks um, as part of that. So hopefully we'll be able to showcase while uh, people actually eating um, the products in Missouri too. Yeah, a lot of that, uh, especially, you know, cause it's going into a shared space with, you know, other exhibits and things uh, was very program heavy. Cause so like, you know, Tiffany came up with a bunch of program ideas. Uh, we also, uh, in kind of a roundabout way, we wanted to link our sites. Um, and so another one of the early things that came out of Tiffany doing this research was an herb garden for our historic site. And so we do get into that, those kind of topics at the historic site that would be down the hill. Um, and so they kind of, it's a linked kind of discussion. So, um, you know, all of our interpretive staff, um, you know, is great at directing visitors and things. So that usually gets mentioned pretty regularly. Jamie, someone has a question. Where do we find a listing of your traveling exhibit offerings and specs? Uh, you would email uh, our curator of exhibits, uh, Sophie, and I think she's in chat so she can put her email in there or you can email myself or Tiffany. Um, and we're working on putting together kind of a catalog, but since we're rebuilding it, one of the uh, things that I've been having a lot of interns do, and this will kind of be a topic maybe for Friday, uh, but we're documenting and then having interns review older traveling exhibits to see if the content's still good or if it's worth traveling. Um, so we don't have an exhaustive list quite yet. That's still on the 
books, but the but the uh, three that we have traveling right now, um, you could reach out to Sophie. And we are working on um, website updates, but because we're like low man on a multi-level multi chain within state parks, sometimes it's hard to get a new um, a new web page link to our site. So we are working on kind of an educational resource page that will have a list of our um, traveling exhibits and our traveling trunks on there. But hopefully that will launch sometime this summer. John has reached out and said, that if anybody knows of anyone who would bring a farm animal or two to some of the summer kids programs, that he would like some, some resources. <laughs> Yeah, John, John really wants to ride a cow into his summer program. So he's been trying to plug that for a while. Has, has John actually ever ridden a cow? I don't know. You'd have to ask him. <laughs> I do not want to see that. Yeah. I, I want to do baby goat yoga on the lawn of the Loman building. So if anybody knows any uh, baby goat owners, um, I'd like to connect. In, in Northwest Missouri, I use, um, I think they're called Farm to Fork Petting Zoo, I think is what it is, but I can send you my link, but they're, they'd be coming quite a ways for you guys, but they do great, great programs for us. Um, do, does anyone else have any questions um, for Tiffany or Jamie? Um, I have a few announcements to make, but um, before we wrap up their portion of this, um, is there any other questions or comments for them? Yeah. Okay, so uh, quickly, thank you guys both so much. I love the partnership that you guys have and the staff at the Missouri State Museum. You guys have a great synergy um, and it's wonderful to see your creativity. And um, Jamie, that, that uh, cartoon book for an online exhibit has got Got me really excited. <laughs> yeah, it's, unfortunately, it's owned by Amazon, so I don't know how to get in contact with them. <laughs> That's like the one downfall of it. Well, I, I like the way that you think creatively and think outside the box and, and try to come up with solutions um, through you know all different sorts of uh, media. So that's amazing. Um, one thing that came up out of our conversation a couple of weeks ago, our colleague conversation, was this idea of doing um, an educational programming series with museums across the state. Um, and so we've pitched that to the Missouri Humanities Council as a Show Me Missouri Museums um, program that we would do a virtual program. Um, so if anybody who is on here would like to be a part of that program, uh, we could set it up to do either a Facebook Live every day or a Zoom meeting that um, parents and <clears throat> now at home schoolers <laughs> Can, um, can jump onto. I think it would be neat to showcase our Missouri museums, um, at each museum kind of taking a turn and talking about giving an educational program. So if that's something that you guys want to participate in, please do send me an email. Um, and my email is sarah, S-A-R-A, at stjosephmuseums.org. Um, we are also working on our plans for our conference, the Missouri Association of Museums and Archives Conference, which is set to be in October. Um, and um, our plan has been that it will be in St. Charles this year, but we don't know if that's going to be an in-person conference or a, um, a virtual conference. But we're gonna start sending out our call for proposals for that. Um, and the topic this year is going to be navigating past, present, and future um, with museums and archives. So it's gonna have a navigation theme. So if you have a project that you're working on that you would like to submit a proposal for, um, be on the lookout for that. And um, we're, we're gonna figure out how we're gonna make that conference happen. Um, the other thing I wanted to announce is the um, Missouri Humanities Council has received some federal funding from the NEH and they are taking applications right now um, for funding. And if you're interested, you, um, you need to be, Part of an organization that probably hasn't applied for and received CARES funding. So I know some organizations did not get their applications in in time and so they may offer another round of funding but if you are um, you know uh, maybe part of a university or um, you know the Missouri State Museum might be something that would qualify for a project for some of that funding 
um, if you were not able to apply for the CARES Act federal funding, Missouri Humanities Council is accepting those applications right now. And you can go to their website. Um, they're also doing um, the Water Symposium today and tomorrow. So if you're interested in um, all that virtual programming about water in Missouri, that's really exciting and fun too. So um, other than that, I was going to share my screen one last time with you all. Um, and encourage you to encourage your community um, to think about going outside and harvesting local things um, because we are in a very abundant state when we think about the food. So these are uh, pictures of pawpaws. And like I say, they kind of taste like bananas. They'll be coming in season. Um, we have black raspberries. We have a bunch of wild black raspberries where I live and we harvest those every year. Um, right now it is mushroom season. So get out there and hunt your morels. Uh, and we keep bringing up black walnuts because they're such a native um, thing for Missouri. Um, and also the plantain, which is kind of like a nature's medicine, um, but kind of like a spinach too. So get out there and get your greens. Um, but I would encourage you guys all to be planting in your garden, even if it's just one thing every year. Um, I planted rhubarb last year. I'm excited that it's growing this year. And, um, it, you know, I shared a couple weeks ago about my walking onions that I got from my grandma um, that come up every year and you just have onions and there's no need to brave the very terrifying grocery stores right now. You can just <laughs> go out there and find food in your backyard. So um, that's all I have. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Tiffany and Jamie. If you have any last words, please feel free to jump on. Uh, thank you for having us. I wanted to apologize for my 1980s action movie bad guy goatee, um, but I had to shave it down for wearing a mask when I had to go out to the grocery store. So, And I just want to say thanks, everybody. We're very excited about our exhibit and hopefully it will, you will see it both at the museum and maybe in your own museums or neighborhoods. So keep it in mind. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And then on Friday, our mama meetup, we'll be talking about virtual internships. So that'll be on 1.30 at Friday. So if everybody wants to jump on that and think about how we're going to supply the demand for all of these students who would love to do internships this summer, but need to do internships this summer, but maybe can't come on site. Uh, we're going to try to figure that out on Friday at 1.30. So thanks, guys, for joining us. Thank you. That was fun, guys. <laughs>